What's good everybody, I'm Keandre, this is Hoopin' Elect, and welcome back to the channel. Now before we get started, I wanna say Happy New Year to all of you, and a big thank you for your support over these past couple years. We just recently hit 30,000 subscribers, which seemed impossible when we first started, so yeah, nothing much else I can say then. Um, I'm really appreciative of your support. COVID is ramped up again everywhere, and of course college basketball did not evade it. So we've got a lot of forfeits, cancellations, and postponements that haven't allowed us to see some really great prospect matchups. But as long as we can keep getting through it and, and the season can keep going, I think we can take the good with the bad. But getting into this board, I thought about bringing the tiers back, but I still think it's a little bit too early and there's not quite enough separation for it to add a lot of value to the video. But I'm hoping to do the tiers and maybe some positional and role rankings to give more context to these boards and even some more focused videos on positions and roles and maybe sleepers um just to shake things up a bit with that being said let's go ahead and get into some honorable mentions there's a lot of talent here and guys we've talked about who are still in the same tier as many of those in the top 60. we've got some familiar international names and then this group of young players who i think have extremely high potential over there on the right i think a lot of them will be returning to school but i like what they've shown from a long-term perspective Marquez Justin Lewis is a versatile four-man who has become one of the Big East best players in his sophomore season. He cooled off a bit from his high start, especially from three, which you hope returns a bit, but he does have early second round type of upside. LSU freshman Alex Fudge is a name I know we'll see next year if it's not somewhere in the second round this year. I'm not 100% sure where to rank certain players like him at the moment, but he's an explosive, excellent defending forward who I think has the potential to turn more wing in time has definite league potential. Damian Collins is a project pick for sure and another one of those sort of pre-draft guys, except he had a lot of buzz coming in. There's a lot to like there far beyond what the stat sheet can show, but it becomes a tougher sell for someone playing just five minutes against all decent teams, especially knowing his pre-college route. I think his game would be a nice compliment to the class coming in next year, so I wouldn't mind that either. Now to the top 60, and starting it off we have TCU's Mike Miles. Miles probably deserves a little more leeway than I've given him in this current situation. He could legitimately be a freshman this year age-wise, and just re-watching the U19 games and his better recent performances, I think he's too talented of a creator not to be considered. Auburn's Walker Kessler had his breakout game against LSU blocking 11 shots and nearly getting a triple-double. The North Carolina transfer is proving himself to be one of the most formidable second round bigs in the class. He's not the most explosive athlete and his shot is a work in progress, but he's pretty fluid at that size and he's certainly boosting his stock over the last month. I've been a bit disappointed in Jabari Walker's progression as a shooter and perimeter player in this very expanded role this year, but I still think he's a league talent as a natural four who will expand a bit as a wing. I love him defensively, but in terms of making that first round push, I don't really see it at the moment, but things could change. Travion Williams is by far one of my favorite players in college basketball, and while he's not the guy that's going to immediately scream NBA, I think he's definitely worthy. He's made tremendous improvements to his body over his four years at Purdue, and his skill level and passing ability is just off the charts. He's a pretty solid defender as well. He kind of reminds me of Montrez Harrell, and I think there's room for a player like Travion. Williams, using the handles, in the lane, up, and in the foul on Ellis is a solid role-playing wing that excels defensively, and while the percentages don't show it, he's definitely improved as a shooter. I'd like to see him be a bit more consistent offensively as Alabama tries to get back on track, but I think Keon is a solid bet in the second round. Johnny Juzang and Jaime Hawkins are still two very solid prospects for different reasons. I think Juzang has the capability to fill a Shamit type of role, and Hawkins is an all-around forward who really makes things happen, but will need to stretch his game out a little bit more. Both of them still have a chance to increase their stock with the March Madness bump, though I'm pretty set on them being somewhere in the second. Terrence Shannon's been dealing with back spasms lately, forcing him to miss the Gonzaga game, among others. The athletic lefty wing went 0 for 5 from 3 against Tennessee in what was collectively one of the worst games I've ever watched, which dropped his numbers a little bit, but yeah, with him, that 3 point shot is likely going to be the decider. Julian Strother has slid right into that Gonzaga wing role and has continued to play it to the fullest. 
He's one of the better catch and shoot guys in the country. He's a good cutter and has good size at 6'7". His game really lends itself well to the next level and for the most part I know what I'm getting out of him. It's definitely been good to see Alan Flanagan back out there, especially with this Auburn team that looks pretty dangerous. Coming off of a partially torn Achilles, I expected him to be brought along slowly, but the second game back against LSU, he was out there looking like himself again. I think he'll be an easy mid-second to potential late first type of guy, depending on how much he's progressed. Peyton Watson is in a very strange position right now. I still think there's a pathway to him contributing and at least flashing the potential he had coming in, but he hasn't made a shot since November 22nd and plays about 10 to 15 minutes a game. I'm confident in him being a future pro or else he wouldn't be here. It's getting tougher to justify and sell higher than this point. I've heard BJ Boston comparisons in terms of situation, but BJ at least played and flashed the prior potential on a game to game basis. Christian Coloco has maintained his place as a big prospect in this class. He rim runs, he blocks shots, he's smooth, has improved his feel and just really looks the part. As centers go, I think there's some really sneaky value from the late first into the second round than in recent memory, and that includes Coloco. Young Jun Lee is certainly on track to be the second Korean born player ever to reach the league. He had a great performance and a huge upset against Alabama and that might have been the solidifier for anyone who was still on the fence about his game. Jordan Hall has continued to be one of the more intriguing mid-major prospects as a 6'8 forward with great potential as a passer and overall offensive creator. There's still a good amount to be intrigued by with Yannick Souza. That type of athleticism and defensive potential is always going to get you excited, but he's got a longer road ahead of him in numerous ways than I initially hoped. Duke's Mark Williams is also in that group of really solid five men. I like his game, I'm not 100% sure where the confidence in him being a top 20 ish guy comes from, and I say that as someone who had him on the borderline of that coming into the year. But as a shot blocker lob threat with potential to stretch his game out, he's intriguing. Like a few other choice prospects in the class, Tristan Vukcevic is in the position where he's going to have the chance to fly up boards and workouts. He doesn't really play enough on a team as high level as Real Madrid to get a full look at his game, but the shot looks great and he's pretty skilled and moves well. For an 18 year old on that level, you have to be excited. To make matters worse, Roko Prokacin is now out 3-4 to four months with what I believe is a broken ankle. I haven't seen this publicized many places so I'm just riding on the Croatian to English translations and of course Roko's Instagram post in the boot. He wasn't off to the greatest start and the injury definitely makes things weird, but he's still 6-4 and four months younger than Chet, Holmgren, and Jaden Hardy so he has time if things don't work out. If Georgetown was a bit better I think Aminu Muhammad would have a lot more fans. He's still a potential two year type of guy, but I like him as a strong and athletic two guard or small wing who always finds ways to score. He's got a lot of skills and touch to improve on, he can still get sped up from time to time. But there's a lot to like in this game. The turnover and decision making issue has reared his head again for Caleb Love, and he was pretty disappointing in a big matchup against Kentucky, but I still like his game and NBA potential though I'm really looking forward to what he does against Trevor Keels and Duke in the future. The Ignite's Mike Foster has a lot of encouraging pieces in his game, especially offensively. That Rashard Lewis-esque jumper will likely consistently stretch out to the three-point line at some point, and he's got good touch and a knack for the ball inside. He's one of the leading shot blockers in the G so far, and though I do have some concerns about him as a five, that's been good to see. One of the players who's having a breakout season is KU's Christian Brown. He's got good size, he's a good athlete, he defends and has been extremely efficient. The main thing that's in the works is a three point shot, but right now, Kansas has two legitimate prospects that I think could get into the first round for the first time in several years. Now Harrison Ingram isn't going to wow you in many ways athletically, he's still got some work to do as a shooter, but as a big 6'8 forward he just knows how to play the game simply put, and he affects it in a variety of ways. I'm pretty much done comparing anyone to Draymond, but there are some similarities there in terms of his versatility. EJ Liddell's early season performance has put him in the running for first team All-American and greatly improved his draft style. He's been a ridiculous shot blocker so far, averaging 3 a game at just 6'7", stretching the floor and being a consistent scoring threat. His game resides somewhere between Grant Williams and Sadiq Bey, and he's got late first to early second type of potential. 
Finally got to watch a little more Ishmael Kamagate over the last several weeks, and to me, he's one of the better centers in the entire class. He's about 6'11", 220 playing for Paris Basketball, where he's the leading rebounder, shot blocker, and is second in scoring for a team with Kyle Quinn, Juhan Begaron, and Ryan Boatwright. I still think Caleb Houston can be a really solid NBA player. But I don't see the lottery or star role player upside that I thought could be there prior to this year. He's a projectable shooter, a pretty good passer, but the lack of much significant shot creation upside and underwhelming defensive performance have me a bit lower on him than some others might be. I'd bet on a Max Christie run down the stretch of this season. I think he's still learning on the fly and trying to carve out a role. But he's got a lot to like as a long, tough two guard with high shooting and scoring potential. He's one of those players I get the vibe would return unless he really takes off, but he'll probably be top 40 worthy for me throughout. A quick look back at the 31 through 60 range. Outside of the first couple games, Bryce McGowan's has really struggled from the field. I'm still very intrigued by his talent and ability to create shots at 6'7", but I'm really looking for him to keep trending in the right direction and make progress because his skill level really jumps off the screen several times a game, even when the shots aren't falling. Notre Dame's Blake Wesley has really impressed me lately. He's got the makings of a great two-guard creator, even in the biggest of moments like that game winner against Kentucky. He's shown a skill level and creativity that is rare among freshman guards, and I think he deserves to be in serious first-round contention, even as he's struggled a bit on defense, especially off the ball, and the three-point shot isn't completely there yet, and with the three-ball not all the way there yet. Usman Zhang has definitely not gotten off to the type of start that anyone would hope for. He's been a mostly non-factor offensively. He's got tremendous flashes as a passer still. He's actually a pretty good defender already, which is positive, especially at that size. But right now, but right now he's looking much more like a project, but one I think could really be worth the risk. Jeremy Sohan is a big athletic floor with a ton of upside, especially defensively. He's a big part of Baylor continuing his run of just being as nasty as possible on that end of the floor. And overall for him as a player, I think he's only scratched the surface. I think he has definite first round potential, especially given the type of offensive skill set he's flashed this year and in the past. Michigan's Musa Diabate has serious first round potential as a current high energy and agile big man with tons left to unlock, especially with the face up game. I think he's Michigan's best prospect and one of the better bigs. Julian Champagne has been one of the higher profile college prospects to fall victim to COVID this year, and it actually cost them a game against Pitt. The 6'8 lights out score is set to return to the court for St. John's here soon, and hopefully it doesn't hamper his performance too much. I wouldn't put too much weight into a couple bad performances given the circumstances, but yeah, in the best scenario, I think he has top 20 possibility. Ochai Abaji is definitely in the running to be the highest selected upperclassman in this draft. He's continued his run of excellence as one of the nation's leading scorers and a solid presence on defense. I think you know what you're getting with Abaji and it should interest teams anywhere from 15 to 25. Tori Eason has been pretty consistently dominant on both ends this season. Averaging 16 and 7 off the bench in just about 23 minutes a game is ridiculous in itself, but you add in there how versatile and effective of a defender he can be first and foremost, you have a guy who I think can easily be a top 20 pick. The shooting is a speed bump that'll likely take some time, but he's been really good in most of the other areas. Not enough good things can be said about Wendell Moore this year. He's the ultimate example of staying at it, keeping your head down, and working. Those were a rough couple years for a recruit of his caliber to endure, but he's turned himself into a legitimate first round prospect. The man is shooting nearly 60% from the floor, 40% from three, and you throw in the 17 5 and 5 stat line. Like, come on. I think he's been Duke's best player, and they have a potential number one pick on the team. It's been a rough few games for J.D. Davison, and it is worrisome. It's impossible not to like J.D.'s tools as a 6'2 super athletic point guard who can really make plays, but the three-point shot, creation in the half court, and now decision making has been in the mud lately. Hopefully he can get through the freshman wall quickly. 
I think Hugo Besson has proven himself to be the best prospect on this breaker squad. We talked about Usman Zhang, who I still really like, but Besson is nice. He's a little older than some others as he'll be 21 on draft night, which is significant, but his ability to create shots both for himself and his teammates is, is terrific. And that stretch he had against Melbourne was about as memorable a stretch a non-Palo prospect has had this year. Kennedy Chandler has definitely cooled off since that 27 point performance against Colorado, shooting just 30% from the field and 3 alike. He's still great at putting pressure on a defense and making plays for others, but punishing the drop like Arizona was forcing him to do, and just creating shots on the perimeter is still there for him to improve. Dyson Daniels box score doesn't always do him justice as a player. Now is he that scorer or engine type of guard? No. But he's been doing basically everything well and even though the shot is still a work in progress, he's had some encouraging moments that I buy. Overall, I just think he's a really solid prospect as an 18 year old 6'6 guard that you can trust in a variety of situations and roles. I'm still a big fan of Trevor Keel's game and I really do think he's going to shoot it better percentage wise throughout the rest of this year. He's too mechanically sound and has the confidence and track record to match. The big issue comes with his finishing at the rim, which has been a huge disappointment, hovering around 45% in the half court. He's on the short list of guard defenders, and he's been really good in the pick and roll this year. Keegan Murray has continued his run as one of the most improved sophomores. From a 7 point fill in the gaps guy to one of the nation's leading scorers in a matter of months, it is super tough. He had a down game against a tough Iowa State team, but he bounced back in a big way against Utah State, giving them 35. The shooting will probably determine if he's a top 12 guy or top 20. I'm still not as high on Nikola Jovic as I was entering the year, but performances like he had against Split and Sevita are super intriguing, and both of those teams are no slouch either. But yeah, a guy who's 6'10", doesn't turn 18 till June, who can dribble pass and potentially really shoot it, should stick in the top 20, even as his defense can be headache inducing at times. Baylor's Kendall Brown has easily been one of the most impressive freshmen in the country and he's doing it for a team that is just tough as nails and should make a deep run. I think he should be in lotto conversations, but my disconnect with him is I don't know if he has the upside of a star. He reminds me of Franz Wagner a bit in that way, though he's not nearly as skilled as a ball handler, passer, or shooter just yet, but I of course still really like him considering where I have him ranked. That Pacific Northwest water must be something different and Marjan Bochamp is a product of it. He got off to a beautiful start this season, had some bumps in the road, but really returned to the spotlight in the G League showcase. He's one of those guys you don't need to run anything for and you look up at the scoreboard and he's got 23. It's a really nice wing prospect at 6'7". I've been having trouble saying much new about overtime Elise John Montero. He's one of the better guard prospects in the class clearly and really showed quite a bit pre-overtime to earn that. But the combination of competition level and lack of standard video and coverage make it a bit tougher to evaluate. There is a possibility I'll see him in person at some point, but we'll, we'll see on that. After getting just two minutes in Duke's first loss of the season at Ohio State, AJ Griffin has played about 20 minutes a night and looked much closer to the guy I thought we'd see coming into the season. I still want to give him a little bit of time before we start having a conversation higher than this, but you can see the immense potential he has as a shot creator and as an athlete, regardless of the competition. He's one of the guys I'll be watching closest over the next month. Wisconsin's Johnny Davis has taken a significant jump from the first board to this one. I still wanted to see just a bit more after the Maui Invitational, and yeah, he's got the goods. He's been a consistent threat as a shot creator, he's a really strong and physical athlete, it just makes a lot of sense as a well-rounded two guard whose game looks like this fusion of Chris Duarte and Jalen Suggs. Ty Ty Washington remains one of the better guard prospects in the class. The SEC play is going to be huge for him because in the two games against good or solid opponents this year, he hasn't performed that well. I think it'll be a classic case of the maxi quickly hero guard who didn't get the keys at Kentucky but blossomed a bit more in the league. Ben Matherin has taken a significant step in terms of consistency as a scorer and it's just been pretty to watch. I really like this Arizona team even as they had that avoidable loss against Tennessee. Matherin's athleticism combined with the shooting, the movement potential, and clear ability to add to his game as a self-creator and defender make him an easy lottery guy right now. 
It's still difficult for me to quit on Jaden Hardy. There are serious concerns about his finishing, the defense is still spotty, shot selection can be sporadic, but it's hard to find guys with the shooting potential, shot creation, and the sneaky playmaking ability that Hardy has. I'm looking to see a little more consistency and hopefully some improvement as a finisher, but right now I still think he's a lottery guy, and to me his upside is about as high as anyone outside of the top four. Patrick Baldwin Jr. is really feeling the effects of what come with playing at a Horizon League school, especially as a guy like him whose game would greatly benefit from the playmaking of other top talents. Now I know a lot of people are going to jump ship and there is reason to be concerned with his ability to get to the bucket and overall impact on the game when the shot isn't falling, but I don't really see many scenarios where I drop him outside of the lottery. He's too talented, we've seen it prior to this, and I think he'll show it more consistently as the season goes on. Now I'm still trying to figure Jalen Duran out a little on this level. He could still be a senior in high school, which is important to note. You're just naturally going to get some inconsistency out of those guys. I'm not super confident in him being that next prospect outside of the top four, but I also can't quit the potential that he has shown, and you have to take into account that this isn't the best situation for his game specifically. Now this top four is very, very likely going to be the consensus for for the rest of the year unless something significant happens. To me, these four have the best combination of projectability, upside, and performance. Unlike last year's group though, I wouldn't say that there's a significant gap between them and they're all very unique. Starting with Gonzaga's Chet Holmgren. I think Chet is becoming a bit underrated. He's going to need to get at least somewhat bigger and stronger, of course, but sort of in the way that Evan Mobley kind of evaded some people if they didn't really watch him play. Chet's impact on the game can go a bit unnoticed. Now, I think Mobley was a far superior prospect in numerous ways, but the slim, fluid, great defensive player comparison is there. I'm always just observing at the beginning of these college seasons, and as soon as I started to want a little bit more out of Jaden Ivey creation-wise, he did just that against Butler, going 6 for 6 from 3, punishing the under, hitting step backs, and even throwing some crossovers in there. And it didn't need to be fully realized, I just wanted to see that side of his potential. He's a tremendous athlete, and at this point it's nearly a done deal that he'll be the first guard picked in the draft. Ivy with a full head of steam, splits him and lays it in. Jabari Smith Jr. is slowly becoming one of my favorite prospects of the last several years. He should not be able to shoot it like this and also defend how he can and handle it a bit and you know, everything else that comes with him. He's about as close to being number one without being number one for me. I just think his skill set is going to translate to the league so well and I can't wait to see him paired with some of the young playmakers on these top pick contending teams. And Paulo Bencaro still holds the number one spot for me, but a few of those others are right behind him. The reason I have Paulo in this spot is because of how advanced he is as a ball handler, perimeter shot creator, to the point that you can just kind of take it for granted. He can score inside as well, of course, and he's made strides as a playmaker in the half court recently. He's one of the few guys I can really picture being a go-to player on offense in the league, and the dude is like 6'10", 250. Here's a recap of the top 30. I appreciate y'all for watching. Be sure to leave a like if you enjoyed, subscribe if you're new, and comment down below what you think of the draft. I'm Keandre, this is Hoobin' Elect, and I'm out. Know me, yeah. You gon' be a star one day, that's what my uncle told me. So I'm trying to make it happen, yeah. How I end up rapping, yeah. Started making money when we dropped that legal trapping.